name is Robert Battle. Um, I was actually born in Jacksonville, Florida, um, 1972. Born uh, completely bowed leg, so I had bowed legs so that it, I needed braces in order to correct that. Um, and not knowing uh, whether I would walk or not, let alone dance. Um, my great aunt and uncle um, sort of took me in um, from my birth mother because she was having some issues at the time and really needed help. And so they stepped in um, and we moved to Fernandina Beach, Florida. They got the braces for my legs and, and got me on my way. When I was probably about four or five, uh, my great aunt had a stroke. And they were already in the winter of their years anyway. Um, she had a stroke, so we moved to Miami with their daughter, Desi Williams, um, who, to help take care of her. And my great aunt died in 1979, uh, leaving her daughter, Desi Williams, uh, uh, in some way um, as my mother. She took on that role. Um, and my great uncle, her father, this gets, you have to this gets a little complicated. Um, her father uh, is who I knew as my dad until he died um, when I was going to my second year at Juilliard. Um, but the wonderful thing about Desi Williams, and I still call her Desily, that's what I call her. Uh, I never called her mother. Um, was that she was very much into the performing arts. Certainly the whole family always got together and sang. Um, around the piano on any number of occasions, or just because somebody went to the piano and started something, and we would all sort of feed in. Um, and she played piano for the church. She uh, was an actress. She had a group called the Afro-Americans. It was her and a few of her friends that did poetry and song uh, relating to the black experience. So I was surrounded by them rehearsing all of this wonderful poetry by Langston Hughes, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, uh, Mari Evans, um, just stuff, uh, uh, spirituals, uh, things that really uh, gave me a window into the history of African Americans in this country, um, just by hearing the music and hearing the poetry. Um, she was an English teacher that was her quote unquote real job. She wanted to be an actress, but um, in those days that wasn't considered practical. Uh, and a lot of people became teachers because of that, uh, but also because they had a passion for it. Um, and so she was an English teacher uh, at Dade County Public School System um, for 30 years or so. So I was also surrounded by uh, literature and Shakespeare and hearing sonnets and, and, and all kinds of things. So words were very important to me. Sound was very important to me. It's what I gravitated to. I was also singing soprano. I had this high-pitched uh, soprano voice until I was 12, which was a blessing and a curse, <laughs> uh, according to the neighborhood kids. Um, but I sang soprano in the church choir. Um, and um, I did a little bit of dancing. I didn't really know what it was. But my mother taught me a song that she would play on the piano, That's Entertainment. And she would sing the words, and I'd sing the chorus, and I'd pretend to be sort of tap dancing. But we were talking about it today. And it's interesting, because part of the refrain is the world is a stage. The stage is a world of entertainment. Um, and that kind of has become my life because of, of, those early, um, of those early notions of, of performance. What I do remember is that when she would recite poetry, they, all of them seemed to grow taller um, when they were singing or something like that. It was no longer my mother. It was a, a sort of other kind of being, you know, and I think for me, as someone who was very shy, uh, who was brought up the way I was, who was taken in, I was always aware of that. Uh, so it, it sort of made me more quiet. Um, and uh, because of the speaking voice, I was shy about talking because people would laugh at my voice. But when I would go in my room and I would 
sort of play a tape recorder and I would sing. And I would pretend to be singing or dancing or whatever for thousands of people. Through the arts, I could grow taller uh, and have a little more courage and be fearless uh, using my imagination and my voice. And so I think that's what the performing arts represented for me. It was that way of tapping into my own creativity, uh, my own sense of being. Um, then, because I studied classical piano <laughs> and um, a soprano voice, I was picked on a lot in the neighborhood, Liberty City, um, somewhat of a tough neighborhood, especially if you sing soprano and you do all the things that I did. Um, I had a friend named James Trimble. And James was one of those guys who sort of grew faster than everybody else. We were about the same age, but he was that much taller. He already had that bass in his voice and all of that stuff. So people were afraid of him, but he was my good friend. So if anybody bothered me, I'd go get James, and James would intimidate them. So one day I said, James, you have to teach me how to fight. And so James started sort of teaching me, and then he said, but you know what? My, my father is a retired third degree black belt. Maybe we should talk to him. We did, and he agreed to train us. So in their tiny living room on a concrete floor, uh, we would do weightlifting and study martial arts with his dad. So much so that I was obsessed with it. Uh, anything I ever did, I sort of, if, if I loved it, I became obsessed. It wasn't enough to learn it. I had to become it. So I'd look at pictures of Bruce Lee and um, movies, and then I wanted to dress like that. So my mom bought me a kung fu suit, you know, with the little buttons, and then I had the flat shoes, and I would wear it around the neighborhood gladly, uh, just walking around in that Miami heat in full kung fu regalia. <laughs> I also had a ninja suit with the mask and all of that stuff. So I was, I, I got a pair of chopsticks, and I would eat my, you know, collard greens with chopsticks. <laughs> I was just totally uh, immersed in that. But through the physical discipline, um, it sort of started to lead me to dancing. So that when that came up, I was ready. The way dancing started at that time, I mean, we were all imitating Michael Jackson. I was singing soprano, so I, I was pretty good at it. Um, but I was studying voice at PAVAC, Performing and Visual Arts Center at Miami Northwestern. I was in junior high or something. And my voice started to change. Um, and crack and do all the stuff that happens in puberty. And I decided I wanted to try out for dance, so I did. So I got into the dance program at Miami Northwestern um, and was progressing pretty well because of my flexibility and my physical discipline that I got through martial arts. Um, and then we went on a field trip to see the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. Uh, on uh, Miami Beach at the Jackie Gleason Performing Arts Center. And when I saw Revelations, um, that it all fit together. If you think about it, all the um, learning, and the, all the poetry, or hearing all those poems by Langston Hughes, um, from hearing the words of Maya Angelou, um, from hearing those spirituals, from understanding the function of the spiritual uh, for a people, that it wasn't just music, but it was also um, sometimes a calling, sometimes um, disguised sort of messages. Um, but it was all about hope and about how with faith we could overcome uh, the atrocities of slavery and bigotry. All of that is in Revelations, and there it was. The things I was learning about movement, um, about spirit, um, all realized in Revelations, uh, Alvin Ailey's uh, masterpiece he created in 1960. Um, and that sealed the deal for me of wanting to go even further in dance, wanting to someday be like those people I saw on the stage who sort of looked like me uh, in a way. And so I made my way to New York City on a full scholarship at Juilliard. Before that, I, I ended up going to New World School of the Arts, uh, which was wonderful. I was on this sort of ground floor of that school in its beginnings. 
Um, auditioned for Juilliard, made my way uh, to Juilliard with a full scholarship because what happened was I got in uh, when they were here recruiting and then they sent what would be the bill. <laughs> and then I called to say to Muriel, Muriel Topaz, who was the uh, head of the dance department at the time that I couldn't come, it was just too much. And um, she said, well, let me call you back, which I thought in showbiz meant don't call us, we'll call you. Uh, but she did call back and say, what if we offered you a scholarship? And I said, yes. And the wonderful thing about being at Juilliard was um, the Ailey Company uh, didn't have a permanent home yet. Um, that happened a little later. But they were rehearsing um, on, I believe, 61st Street uh, uh, near Amsterdam. And Juilliard was on 65th. So um, I could go over there. I could sort of peek. Um, in the summer, I would study um, in the summer program at Ailey. I would have what I call Judith Jamison sightings. You know, where, I mean, who didn't want to see Judith Jamison? And I would see her, and I remember calling home on the payphone uh, to say to my mother that I saw Judith Jamison. I mean, never knowing that someday she would choose me to succeed her. <laughs> 